right, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is Git for five-year-olds. Um, just to start with a little disclaimer here, um, this isn't actually for five-year-olds. I did try this on my son, and he walked out about halfway through and played Minecraft, so I <laughs> might have to get that out there. Um, also importantly, this isn't for Git experts. If you're a Git expert, you're welcome to stay. You might pick something up. But uh, the goal of this talk is definitely for people who never heard of Git or a version control system, or maybe use it a bit and want to get a little bit more uh, familiar with it. So that's our main focus for that. It's also aimed mostly at theme, plugin developers, anyone who uses code. Uh, if you're a marketing or business owner or SEO, um, you might still pick up something useful here, especially in terms of being able to talk easier with your developers. Um, but that's our main focus here is in terms of working with Git with code. A bit more about this talk. Um, this was actually inspired by my wife, who's a WordPress developer and has been developing for a while, uh, but really lacks a kind of system for keeping her code organized. And so she asked for my advice, and I suggested that she check out Git. And she said, OK, well, how do I learn about Git? And being the loving husband that I am, I told her to Google it, right? Um, and so she spent some time Googling it, and unfortunately had trouble finding the resources. I think that part of the challenge with Git is that it's a tool that was made by developers, and it was made for developers. And a lot of the learning resources out there for it are really oriented towards a developer. And it just kind of throws you into the pool, right? So if you search Google for Git tutorial, generally the first uh, result that comes up is uh, like Git Wikipedia. And this is the first step they have. They say, open terminal, right? Immediately, you know, when you say open terminal, you're going to lose half of your audience there. And you know, even if you're completely comfortable with terminal, just going to terminal and running commands you're not really understanding a lot of the foundations there. Um, it's great to learn from example. I love learning by example. But I kind of learned to get this way myself. And um, you're typing things and really you know, don't know what you're doing. Um, and that can lead to some problems down the road when things get a bit more complicated. When I learned Git, I decided to really dive you know, deep into it and learn everything from the ground up. And I ended up watching this video uh, literally five, five and a half hours long, I think, of two guys talking about Git in front of their computers. So this is what I meant by being, you know, into developers. Uh, not really the most fascinating thing, a lot of wireframes and flowcharts and, and that type of thing. I certainly learned a lot about Git, but if I had shown this to my wife, she, well, I don't want to go into that, but you could get the idea. So what are we going to cover in this talk? Uh, we're going to start with Obviously, what is Git? That's a pretty important thing to cover before we get to any examples or terminology, anything like that. What problems does it solve? So, how is Git going to help you on a day-to-day -day basis? And you know, if you need an excuse to learn it, this is why. Some terminology, not the funnest thing to learn about, but very important to understand at least some of the terms that Git uses. It, it tends to have some pretty arcane ones that are not very intuitive, uh, like rebase and bisect, things like that. So we're going to make sure we at least understand the fundamental commands that you're going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we use it? So my goal is not only to go over what it is and have a good understanding, but I want to actually show you how to use it so that you can go home you know, Saturday night, what else you're going to do, load up Git, and you know, try it on your own projects. And, get started with you feel completely comfortable with getting it up and running with your own projects. And then of course this is WordCamp. So what do we need to know about how it interacts with WordPress? It's pretty straightforward, but there are a few things and a few mistakes you can easily make if you're not kind of prepared for that. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a senior web developer over at Fallon Garrison <coughs> Advertising Agency in the Seaport District of Boston. And that's my day job. And nights and super, super early mornings I'm doing freelance consulting and Adaro consulting. And I've had the opportunity to use WordPress both at these companies and, and for a while now. And it's a you know, fantastic system, but it's certainly gotten more complex than it was 10 years ago. It was pretty much just used for blogs. And with that complexity comes the, right on to be a necessity of having some way to keep your code 
sane and organized and backed up and everything like that. And I found it to be a really great solution for that. So what is Git? Well, Git is defined as a uh, version control system, which naturally leads to the question, what's a version control system, right? A version control system is a system for recording and managing the changes to your code. So what this basically means is that every time you're making changes to your code, those changes are recorded in the system. They're recorded by using something called a revision. And this is a really key concept to get. A revision is a grouping of a, a group of changes or a single change made to your code. So you can think of it as a, a snapshot of your code at that point in time. So it's not like you're just storing just those changes. You're actually storing your entire project at that time. Okay. And this is really fantastic because it means as you're working on a project for a couple of days or weeks or months or years, you're going to have your entire history of your work on, of your project um, is stored into Git. And, and this gives you a lot of uh, really fantastic options with, with what you can do, which we're going to go into. With each revision you make, you're going to write a short message describing the changes. And I find this is really uh, one of the confusing points people come into a lot with, with uh, learning Git is you might have used uh, a good example of Google Docs, which automatically creates revisions of your document. And the key word there is automatically, right? So every, I don't know exactly how it works, but when you pause for a few seconds, it'll save your changes. Uh, so you hit save, it'll save that revision there. And you can look back in history, but there's no real method to what those revisions are. They're kind of just randomly taken of what you were working on at that point. With Git, your revisions you make are clearly defined by you. And so one of the goals here is when you make a revision to your code, you're trying to really encapsulate some changes that you've made. So if you go in and you change styling on a header, that's a really good example of a revision, right? So you spend 30 minutes changing some CSS and some markup to change how your header looks. That's when you would make a revision in Git. And so this is a really organized set of changes. So you're not going to have a revision that says change lines 13, 14, 15 on header.php. Right, you're going to have this in a really human readable format, which is really useful later on, as, as we'll see. So I mentioned that Git is a version control system. Uh, it's actually a distributed version control system. And uh, the delineation here is that Git, unlike certain other uh, version control systems, is not centralized. And basically what this means is all of your changes that you make to your code, all of your revisions, all of your notes about that, it's all stored on your local computer. Other version control systems have a more centralized approach, where all of those changes and everything are stored on a remote server. And that leads to problems that you'll encounter anytime you're working with a remote server, where you know, how's your connection? Do you have to connect to a VPN? Um, you know, are you in an airport without good Wi-Fi? What happens if the server goes down or the server explodes? That type of thing. The great thing about Git is everything is on your local computer. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to exist in other places and that you're not going to be sharing it with people, but it does mean that you're going to have really fast access to all of this history and everything else that Git offers. Speaking of history, uh, just briefly about Git. Uh, it's a free and you know, open source project, so you never have to pay for Git. You might have to pay for add-ons or software around it, but it's free itself. And it was inspired by one of the biggest free and open source projects, which is Linux. Uh, it was actually developed by the people who made Linux because they found a lot of frustrations with using the version control systems at the time. And when they decided to make Git, they actually approached it where they said, let's do, take everything that the current systems do and do it in the opposite way. Right? So there was a lot of change here that was happening with this. The term Git, and I didn't know this until recently, I assume you know, computer science is an acronym for something or it's you know, a shortened version of a word or something technical for that. Git is actually just British slang for an unpleasant or contemptible person. And that's it. Right? There's, there's nothing more to it than that, which is kind of funny considering how complex and advanced Git is. The definition is pretty straightforward. And if you're wondering why it was named that, uh, the creator of this uh, line of historical to make Linux said, I'm an egotistical bastard and I name all my projects after myself, first Linux, now Git. So he named it after himself because he considers himself to be a contemptible person. And that, that's kind of a little colorful history for Git, and that's pretty much how colorful Git gets. So <laughs> it's all downhill from here, I guess. So what problems does Git solve for you? 
backup is the first one. And, and even at its most simplest, even if you're only using, and you install Git and you use two of the commands, you're going to have a really fantastic backup system for your code. So first, you know, I, maybe you're backing up your code right now, maybe not, maybe you're FTPing into your live server and editing your code live, which is just so dangerous and really leads to bad things. Uh, maybe you are working remotely, or sorry, are working locally, and you have a backup of your files, but it's happening each night, right? Well, it's still unfortunate if you work all day on something and something breaks or gets deleted, and your last backup was eight hours ago, right? That's, that's still pretty depressing. And then maybe you're taking backups more often than that, but are you creating multiple copies of that backup? So, you know, you're working on your project, you're having backups. A few days go by, you realize you made some changes that completely broke everything, right? Well, you have a backup, but unfortunately that backup contains all that code that broke something. And you have no way of going back to that perfectly working version of your code. Git solves a lot of these problems. One note on this is that um, Git is backing up these changes, but as I mentioned earlier, it's storing this all locally on your computer, right? So we're going to talk a little bit later about something called Revokes, which is storing your Git repository somewhere else. So I just want to get that out there and make sure people are clear that even though you're having backups to your code, you're still occurring locally. It's really important to still have those changes stored off-site on a, a, another server. One really other great thing about Git and the way it backs up your code is that it's really, really difficult to permanently destroy something when you're using Git. So a simple example is if you have a file and you delete it and you save that deletion as a revision of Git, you, even a year later you can actually go back in time and restore that file. So Git is really great about that. It takes a lot of skill to break something in Git. Uh, you have to use some of the more advanced commands and they give you a lot of alarm bells, that type of thing. You can even specifically delete all of your history to Git and then type a command to get it all back. So if you manage to break it, you're pretty talented. Another really wonderful feature about Git is, is the ability to very easily undo changes that you've made. So say you have a client who has an e-commerce system and you make an unrelated change somewhere else that you don't think will affect anything. Push that live, and then you get a call at three in the morning. I feel a little bad at three in the morning. It's always kind of slight as the time that people call you at. So okay. Uh, so say two in the morning, you get a call, um, and you know you have to go and get their site back in working order. Well, if you didn't have something like Git, you would have to kind of backtrack and think, okay, what did I change? How might this have affected it? All that type of thing. With Git, what you could do is. Literally, with a couple clicks, you click on the last time you build the project was working, so earlier that day, and you restore it to that point, you put it up on that server, and it's working again. So you've immediately resolved that issue. But the other cool side of that is that those changes that you did work on that day, that you had to undo, they're still there. So you can then go back after you've gotten some you know, good rest and look at that and look at those changes and fix that issue and then continue on. So it's really, really great for being to undo, especially in those urgent types of situations. Git is really essential for teamwork. Um, I, I don't know how people manage to code on a team before Git. It allows multiple developers to work on a project. Uh, at the same time, same project, same file, even the same lines of code. Previous uh, version control systems had a concept of where you would lock a file. So you would check out a file, you would say, I'm working on this file right now. Start working on it. You get hungry and go to Chipotle and you know another developer sitting there saying, I need to work on this and I can't because it's checked out. There's no concept of that locking out type mechanism yet, which is really great and allows for fluid work to happen. When you're ready, it also really helps with merging your changes together. So it automatically it'll be able to take changes developer made to file A and developer B made to file B and bring those changes together without you having to do anything, which is great. When two developers are working on the same file and the same lines, it's really great at assisting you with bringing those changes together. So if someone changed a class of an element to something and somebody else <coughs> changed it to another class, it will show you those changes and allow you to choose, okay, take my changes, take the other person's changes, 
or let me just manually write in my own changes. So it's really great for that. Um, also, it makes blaming really easy. And I know this is odd to be on the teamwork, but you can look at a file and it'll show you next to every line in the file, the last person who made a change to that line of code, when they made it, that type of thing. It makes it really easy to uh, point fingers, I guess, for better or worse. <laughs> Git is really uh, great at assisting with deployment, and this is a little more of an advanced topic, but it's worth mentioning because down the road it's something you can really look forward to. Deployment is just a formal term for taking your files and uh, copying them to a live server. So it's, it's really my feeling that in 2013, we, sh we, sh we shouldn't still need to be you know, manually copying bits and files from your local server to your own server. It's really error prone and uh, can take a lot of time and really can easily be solved by technology like Git. So how Git works like this is by having something called hooks, which if you use WordPress, you can code it and refer to hooks. They're basically just a endlessness where it says, okay, every time you, for example, create a revision, I want you to take these actions. So a very uh, practical example of that is every time I make a revision, I want you to take my code, I want you to take that newest version of the code and push it to the server. And you don't have to do anything. So all you're doing is making a revision, Git takes care of the rest of it. A less practical but more fun example is something called LOL commits, LOL commits where every time you make a revision, takes a picture of you and writes down your commit message beneath it. So, completely useless, um, but a good example of the way you can integrate these hooks into your workflow. I don't advise using this because it just leads to really unflattering pictures that you don't want to look at. So, so for some terminology, uh, there's around 150 commands in Git. And this is one of those things that I think really turns beginners off is, you know, if you install Git and type Git and it shows you all of these commands, it can be extremely overwhelming. Luckily, we only have to worry learning today uh, about a few of these. And in your day-to-day, -day, you're going to be using the same set of a half dozen or so commands all the time. And very rarely do you even have to go outside of that, even when you're in an intermediate or more advanced user. So don't get too intimidated by that large number of commands. So the first term we're going to learn about is a repository, uh, or a repo. Uh, this is the heart of it. This is where all of your changes and your code is stored. Uh, technically, it's literally a hidden folder, .git that's created in the folder where all of your other files are. And this is what stores all of your history and changes. And it is the process of creating a new Git repository. So this could be creating a new Git repository in an empty directory where you're then going to work on your project. Or it could be creating a new empty repository in a directory where you already have an existing theme. So if you decide to go back and start integrating Git with your workflow, you would initialize a Git repository in your theme or plugin or code that you're working on. The other side to that is clone, which is taking an existing Git repository and cloning it to your system. So if there's another developer who started working on a project and you want a copy of that, you would clone it. And that brings not only the entire history of the project to your local system, but it also brings all the files as well. So it's a really easy way to get up and running a Git repository. Commit. So this is the most important command, and this is what you're going to be using 90% of the day when they're working with Git. This is what actually creates the revision that, that we've been talking about. So it makes that snapshot. When you commit, you're going to choose the files that you've been working on that have been changed that you want to have part of that revision, and you're going to write a note about that. So if you've been working on your header.php and your style.css has been making changes to a menu, you would include those two files and say, update it and then it look nicer, that type of thing. So that's what committing is. Um, and again, that's what you're going to be doing most of the time when you using Git. Remote. Remote is just the term for a external server which hosts your Git repository. When I was talking earlier about making sure your Git repository is backed up somewhere, that's the remote. Remote is where your repository is stored externally. Remotes are also essential if you're doing any kind of working with other developers. 
So if you're just working in your local system, assuming you have a backup, you actually don't need a remote. But if you do want to share your code with anybody else, or you do want to deploy your code to another server, the remote is where that code lives. So you never actually log into the remote and do work directly on it. It's just kind of the storage base for your Git repository. If you've heard of GitHub, GitHub is a remote. It's a really popular remote. I certainly recommend looking at using it, and we're going to check it out a little bit later in our demo. Push and pull. Uh, these are the last two vocabulary terms. Um, pushing and pulling is interacting with the remote that we just talked about. So as you're working uh, with your code and you're making commits, you're just working locally. When you want to share that information, that's when you push to your remote. So pushing is just chain taking all of the commits that you've made and pushing all of those commits or revisions up to your remote server. Pulling is doing the exact opposite. So if you're working in a team uh, and you're making a lot of changes, you just made a whole bunch of changes over the past hour or two, you'd probably push that code up to your team, who could then, using the books we talked about earlier, be alerted, you know, John just made all these changes to this file, here's a list of what he did. Then they could pull those changes down, and it would automatically take all those changes, integrate it with their files, and they would now have the most recent copy of everything they are working on. Uh, sure. So if pushing Change it, puts them on the remote server. When you commit them, where are you putting them to? Committing is local. Okay. And that's a, that's a, I'm glad you asked that because that, that is a concept that's a little difficult to remember is that most of the time you, you are working locally with Git. And again, that's why it's called a distributed version control system because you're just working on your local system. The only time that you're interacting with something externally is when you're pushing or pulling. So how do we actually use Git? So hopefully at this point you have a basic understanding of the foundations of Git. How do you get up and running with that? Git, by, made by its nature, is a command line tool. And there's a bit of disagreement in terms of learning Git. A lot of the tutorials and approaches to it say, you know, open up the terminal window and start using it. And I think after a while, if you want to use the terminal, that's fine. I use it a lot with Git relatively simple things, but Git is, I think, a more visual tool. You know, if you're making changes to your code, it's much easier to see those changes in a uh, window with you know, color and scroll bars and that type of thing and, and different characters rather than a terminal window. And so I personally find using GUIs around Git is a perfectly fine thing to do. And that you're really not missing anything by learning Git that way, as long as you understand a lot of the terminology and concept, concepts that we've been talking about. So installing Git, thankfully, is a relatively easy process. It didn't used to be. But now, if you're on Windows or Mac uh, or Linux, it's pretty much uh, downloading this executable and installing it. It'll prompt you for a few options. But in most cases, you can just go ahead with whatever default options it selects. That's the website for it. If you just search for uh, Git, it'll bring you to that same site. After that, I would recommend installing something called Source Tree, which is a, a Git uh, GUI. Uh, there's a fair number of Git GUIs out there, not quite as many as you might expect for something as popular as this. The reason I recommend Source Tree uh, is I personally find it to be the best client. It's very intuitive and quick and hasn't broken anything for me yet. It's also free, which is wonderful, especially at a conference where you want to recommend something to people. Uh, it's made by a company called Ed. Atlassian, who makes some other great products. Uh, it's constantly updated every week or so. I find new updates for it. It's also cross-platform, so if you're working on a team with Windows and Mac, everybody can be using the same program. So I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, after that, if you want to look at other GUI clients, especially on Mac, there's uh, quite a number of options out there. But um, personally, in my time using Git, I haven't found anything that's, that's worked as well as this. So I definitely recommend checking it out. So now we're going to do a live demo, which I always try to avoid, but I think it's really important for understanding uh, how to actually go about using this. Bear with me for one second while I...
Okay, so first thing we're going to do is the road source tree. So the goal is to, in just in five minutes, show you how to get up and running with this. Um, assuming that you've been able to, all I've done at this point pretty much is installed Git and installed source tree. So we're going to use this demo based on the 2013 theme. Um, I know this is difficult to read, but um, you just have to keep in mind that we're just going over some basics of using source tree. Don't worry about the actual code, that's not the purpose of this. It's just kind of showing you the general steps you take. So what you would do in source tree is you would create a new repository, right? We're creating a new repository because we have our existing files, in this case it's the 2013 theme. So all I'm doing is I'm saying I have these files on my desktop in 2013. And I create my repository. Then when I open it up, it shows me all the files in the, in the theme. That question mark just means uh, these are new files. I haven't seen these before, which makes sense because this is a brand new repository, right? Here's this commit button. So there's a whole lot going on on this screen. Really, all you're going to be using, even on a day-to-day -day basis, is the commit button, the pull button, and the push button. Like I said, Git has a lot of options out there, uh, but in general, you're going to be using a small subset of those. So you'll see when we commit, we're just going to take all of our files and say, um, initializing repository. And here's our first commit. So in source tree, uh, there's two views. One shows you the changes that you've made to your files. Right now there are not, right, because it's brand new. The second view shows you a log of all of your revisions. And this is, again, the heart of it. This really shows you all the changes that you've made. So here's my first commit where I've initialized everything. Now if I go into my editor, and I open up, for example, um, a header file. I'm going to just show a few quick examples. So, for example, I'm going to delete whatever this is. Again, the code isn't important here. It's just the example of what we're doing. So I've deleted something. I've uh, changed a class for something. And then let's go ahead and uh, create a new menu. So here I have a new menu here. So I'm going to go ahead and save my file. Now if I go back into source tree and I go to my file change view, here's the file that I've changed. If I click on it, this will show me all of the changes that I've made. So you can see the items that I've deleted, modified, and added. Now all I'm going to do is commit. And here's where I'm going to type in my message for what I've changed, right? So change snap bar. I hit commit, and I go to my repository view, my log view, and here's my new commit message. Um, I don't quite have time to show you the pushing and pulling aspect, uh, but that's pretty much as simple as you go onto GitHub, create an account if you don't have one. I have to show this anyway. <laughs> create a repository, so let's say 2013. Create a repository. It gives you a URL, so this is the URL for your remote where your Git repository will live. And I know I'm breezing through this, but um, Source Tree has some really great tutorials for stepping you through the actual GUI aspect of this. So I add my remote, which is GitHub. And now I'm connected to this remote. So I can go ahead and push my changes that I've made. So I've got two commits here. I push those to GitHub. And now here's my repository with all of my files and my commits and changes that I've made. So if you've ever made, if you ever used GitHub before, here we've gone and created a repository, pushed it to GitHub in a couple of minutes. Uh, lastly, just to quickly, sh quickly show you on source tree, uh, this is a repository for a project called Ghost, which is a blogging platform that a lot of people contributed to. But you can see here all of the commits that they've made. And these are, these are just on a, I mean, these are several commits a day. But you can see how much is going on here and how much they rely on Git for their day-to-day the -day usage of this project. It's also really neat that you could clone their repository and you have all the files right there and also see every single change that's happened since the beginning of the project. So lastly, uh, Git and WordPress, 
Um, there's not much to worry about for using this. The main thing you want to do is you don't want to create your Git repository at the root level of WordPress. You don't want to include the WordPress core or the main content folder or plugins folder. You want to keep all of that separate because you don't really care about you know, what changes have been made to the Git core. I'm oh, sorry, the WordPress core. <coughs> you want to create your Git repository inside the place where your custom code is. So inside your theme folder, inside your plugin folder. If you're working on a theme and a plugin, you're going to have a repository for your theme and a repository for your plugin. So just your custom code. Uh, next steps, some more things for you to do after this. Um, online tutorials. I'll post my slides and some resources that I find useful for you to look at if you're interested in learning more about Git. Uh, those will help you learn some more intermediate concepts like branching and merging, which are far too above what we're talking here, but are really not that complicated for you to understand and start integrating. And also, you know, learning a bit more about using on Git on the command line, which is pretty useful for getting your repository up to a remote server. Uh, so that was it. I know that was quick, but hopefully you got a good foundation of Git and you know how to start using it. Uh, I'll take questions here and then uh, for a couple minutes, and then I'll be down at the uh, happiness desk after. Uh, yeah, is there a microphone? Oh, oh, yeah. Here. So, one, one key thing you want to be able to do when you backed up and then find your broken your site is actually go back a step. To, could you just demonstrate how you would roll it back and then still keep the code that you need to go fix? Sure. That's a very quick thing to show. Um, so say for some reason I wanted to go back to my initial commit that I made there um, in source tree. What I would do is I would right click on that and I would click on reverse commit. And so this would basically create a new revision reversing everything that I've done. And one kind of important concept with Git is that you can never actually change history. Well, you can change history, but you really shouldn't, especially as a beginner. Generally what you're always going to be doing is creating new revisions. So it's a little tough of a concept to wrap your head around, but you're going to create a new revision on doing everything that you had done in this event there. That's, even, that's something called cherry picking. Um, that's a little bit tougher to kind of show quickly, but if you Google that term, you know, you'll get a good overview of it. All right, um, you see sometimes on websites they have a thing that says fork me on GitHub. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> sure. Uh, forking is cloning the repository to your own system. So you have your own copy of the entire project, like I just showed for this ghost project. It lets me work on that project, make changes to that project. And then what I do is something called a pull request, which is saying, look at these cool changes that I've made. You should incorporate this into your project. You can't actually push to somebody else's project. That would be pretty dangerous. But instead, you do something called a pull request, which asks them to take your changes into it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Thanks. I'm brand new to Git, and I have a client that's using it, and I'm told that it's very difficult to use with Rackspace. Do you happen to have any experience with Rackspace and pushing to Rackspace? Uh, I've used Rackspace a fair amount before, and I'm trying to think of what would prevent it um, from being used there. One unfortunate thing about Git is that, and this, this might be the case at Rackspace, but especially if clients who have you know GoDaddy hosting or something like that, a lot of times you can't get terminal access to just go in and install Git, and they won't have it on there. So you have no way to go in and do that nice deployment where you can pull your changes down that you've made. Um, there is a really fantastic solution to that. There's a program, uh, web app called Beanstalk. It's actually the only one I know that, that does this really smoothly, but what it does is Beanstalk is your remote, so instead of GitHub, uh, Beanstalk would be your remote. And in Beanstalk, you actually configure the FTP parameters for that server. So you put in a Rackspace's FTP parameters, and you put in a folder where the website was. And then what Beanstalk does is every time I push in Git, pushes to Beanstalk, Beanstalk takes that code and automatically uploads uh, upload it via FTP to Rackspace, which is really awesome because I do find a lot of clients don't have servers where you can just go in and install Git, configure it, that type of thing. And I think Beanstalk starts at $15 a month, something pretty reasonable. So that's a way to get around servers um, that might have one. Accessibility. So to follow up on that last question for um, teamwork and things like that, and you're not dealing with a local host, 
and you're not are you not you're not pushing it to an actual web server. So how do you how do you work in teams to see the changes actually committing on a web server? It's a basic question. Sure, sure. Um, so if you are working in a team, you do need at least a remote. So you don't need necessarily a web server, but you do need that remote because that remote is basically a I think it's literally called a bare bones repository where its only function is to store the changes in your code and communicate with the other developers. So if you if you do want to work in a team, you just have all the team use the same remote. So you could still use GitHub, you know, for that for that reason, and you just wouldn't be interacting with a uh, a live web server in that respect. So hope that answers it. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Not at all. It's really, it's it's tough, and it kind of kills some of the excitement about Git and WordPress. So when you're using Git and WordPress, if you're in WordPress, you're making changes to your settings, your widgets, adding post pages, custom post type. None of that is stored in Git. Uh, Git is only changing, only saving the changes to your file system, so your theme files, that type of thing. All of those changes you're making, those are stored in the SQL database. There isn't really a Git for SQL or a Git for databases. There's a couple of paid plugins for WordPress. One I think is called RAMP that allow for that. I haven't ever actually talked with anybody who successfully used one of those. Uh, if you want to synchronize your database between your local system and your remote system, it's mostly a case of using uh, terminal scripts which automatically export your database, uh, change the host name, FTP them up to the remote server, that type of thing. So, Unfortunately, their Git doesn't cover that part of the, uh, the synchronization. Any other questions? Um, so it seems to be dependency on when you commit the change uh, on um, your description of what's actually changed. Is there like best practice? Particularly when you're in a shared team, when you're in a team, as opposed to you know, just working on something by yourself, you know, hopefully you know what you meant when you put the description in. Sure. Is there like the best practice for, for the actual commit description? Um, yeah, it, it does. It's it somewhat is a personal preference. Um, just in case I didn't make it clear, you have my you'll get the uh, commit message, so change that bar. But Git does really specifically say everything that changed. So if I say change the nav bar, that's actually not a great message because like, what, what did I change? Well, I can go and look in the code and see, oh, I deleted this whole thing and I, I added the secondary nav bar. Um, in terms of when to make those revisions, it mostly, I think, comes from practice. Uh, like I said earlier, you want to make a revision when it's, you can really encapsulate a change. So you, if you've just been working all over the place, generally it means you probably didn't commit early enough and you have a whole bunch of different changes. Although you can, again, select just the specific files, make a commit of that, then select the other files that you modified and make a commit of that. Um, but it, it is kind of personal preference. I'd say the biggest piece of advice is if you need to commit, commit often. It definitely is better to commit more than to work all day and then make a commit and have eight hours worth of work and really have no memory of what you've changed. All right, so I think we just hit five o'clock, so um, I'll be around here and then downstairs after, and I hope that was successful.